We're coming together again for another study in the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs 11 today. Proverbs 11. Hope you can get your Bibles out and follow with me. Uh, the 11th chapter, which means we've been doing two a week. We've been in this isolation for about five weeks at least. And it just seems such a long time. I know my hair might be getting a little long. You can see it's getting a little long here. I need a haircut. If you look really close, the roots of my hair are starting to turn white. <laughs> okay, I guess they're always white. Uh, but anyway, we've been doing this for an awful long time. But we're turning lemons into lemonade. You know, let's make all the lemonade we can. We get to study a little bit more than we might normally. We get to have this special study in the book of Proverbs during the week. So I'm glad we're able to do this. I'm glad you've been able to join me in, in these studies. So let's take a look at uh, chapter 11. And chapter 11 is going to continue this series of contrast. Uh, these two-line contrast uh, that remind us the difference between wisdom and folly, righteousness and wickedness. So let's begin in verse 1. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Talks about honest business dealings, uh, an honest balance. Uh, you don't use a, one balance to sell things and another balance to buy things. And this is really important. We take it for granted that we have a department of weights and measure here in the United States. And they take extreme efforts to try to make sure that the gallon of milk you buy at Fred Meyers is the same size as the gallon of milk you buy at, at Winko. A yard is a yard, and, and uh, we take this for granted. But this has not always been the case. Not only are there different uh, methods of measurements, but it changes from country to country. Uh, some use the metric system, some use other methods. And so he's just saying, though, whatever method you're using, make sure it's an honest weight. Make sure you're being uh, upfront with who you're dealing business with. And uh, a just weight is a, a delight, he says. When pride comes, then comes dishonor, but with the humble is wisdom. With pride comes dishonor. Pride, that proud person, he's got... <laughs> He, he, he thinks very highly of himself. He's got a distorted view of himself. And he expects others to have that same kind of view. And when they don't treat him the way he wants to be treated, and oftentimes he's treated the way he should be treated, and sometimes he just feels like there's a lot of dishonor there. You know, the, the humble person who has a, a, a good view of himself uh, is never, never disappointed. And he's just saying that there's uh, always going to be disappointment for the proud and the humble. They're going to get through things. And so there's wisdom there. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. That sounds pretty, uh, that sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? In fact, a lot of these proverbs seem to indicate what we might call karma. You know, karma is um, from the Eastern religions, but I'm sure they got it from Scripture because Scripture tells us over and over. If you do stupid things, you're going to expect to get stupid results and consequences. If you live righteously, you're going to have good results. And there's a sense of karma. The integrity of the upright will guide them, and the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. Verse 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. You cannot buy the forgiveness of sins. It just doesn't happen. Riches don't help you in the day of your death. After death, there's nothing there. Well, one of the big problems we saw in history was the sell of indulgences. This idea that people came up with, the idea that you could actually purchase the temporal forgiveness of your sins. And this was a big money maker, of course, for the Roman Catholic Church. And this was also the reason that uh, Martin Luther uh, was so upset and started the, the Protestant Reformation movement. And so riches do not profit in the day of death. You can't purchase your way out of it, and it's not going to help you at all. But righteous delivers from death. Only uh, the righteous can have the forgiveness of sins. 
verse 5, the righteousness of the blameless will smooth his way, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will deliver them, but the treacherous will be caught by their own greed. Again, this kind of idea of karma. Uh, you know, that there's going to be consequences. Uh, Paul is going to talk about it later on he, in, in Galatians. So, you know, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And we'll take a look at that passage in just a little while. In verse 7, when a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish, and the hope of strong men perishes. Hope was not made for the wicked. <laughs> the wicked have no hope. Uh, the strong person, the one who relies on his, his strength, uh, he has nothing to look forward to either. Only those who trust in God have a hope. A hope is a confident expectation of what will have in the future. And so you can see that it is based in wisdom. A wisdom is the ability to make a decision today knowing what the outcome will be tomorrow. And hope is that ex confident expectation that the way we're living our lives today are going to make a difference in the future, in eternity. And that's what Jesus has come to purchase is that hope, that confident expectation that we have. A bedrock for Christians is this hope. But he says, when the wicked dies, that's it. His expectations perish. And the hope of strong men, they perish too. Verse 8. The righteous is delivered from trouble, but the wicked takes his place. Uh, justice works. That's what he's saying. Justice works. The righteous is delivered and the wicked is punished. Uh, the justice works. So inevitably, justice wins out. Verse 9. With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish, there is joyful shouting. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is torn down. He who despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps silence. He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. And this is a section talking about the way we, we treat our neighbor, talk about our neighbor. Notice verse nine with his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous will be delivered. And he says almost the same thing in verse 12. He who despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps silence. There is that, uh, that desire sometimes to look down on other people and, and talk about them, build herself up in that way. And also there is this sense, and I think it's part of our American psyche, to love a scandal. I mean, this is especially true in politics, and it's nothing new. If you go look at the presidency of George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, if you look at these early uh, fathers of our country and you come to today, you don't see anything different. There's always been scandal. There's always been uh, people talking about them in, in a bad way. Uh, they've always been looking for the flaws in their character and, and uh, expanding on those and exaggerating those. Uh, you know, news sometimes is talking about news. Uh, it's talking about things that are happening within our country. But it, it's sad to see that so much of news today has just turned to scandal, uh, looking for one scandal after another. And it's not different. Nothing's really changed in our country. It's the same as it's always been. It's just that we've multiplied the amount of people who are doing it. And, and so he's just warning us here to stop looking at our neighbor and trying to find fault with them. Uh, you know, a wise person just covers up these little flaws that we see in our neighbors. And it doesn't try to exaggerate those things. In fact, host cities, he says, are exalted, are torn down by this kind of gossip that goes on. And it's, it's true in political sense. It's also true within the church. 
Uh, there's no need to, to go around looking for fault and finding out problems and looking for every flaw that you can find that just causes uh, difficult situations. And the same, the same idea is, is reiterated in the New Testament, by the way. I was just reading from the book of James on Sunday, and I recall these passages here in James that talk about the same exact thing. In James chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Stop judging your brothers. Stop judging your neighbor. Stop looking down and trying to find fault with everyone. And in chapter 5, he comes back to the same idea. Verse 9, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Stop judging people. Stop looking for faults. Uh, stop being hypocritical and judgmental. Those are such easy faults to fall into, to somehow try to elevate ourselves by looking down on others. Uh, and so is James. And there's another passage that has helped me a lot. Uh, and it is in the book of Acts, verse 23 especially in the sport of political scandal that we see today. Uh, I've seen it all my life, and I continue to see it today. It just seems though it has become more and more uh, abundant. Uh, in Acts 23, an interesting thing takes place. Paul is taken before the council, the Jewish council. And Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that this was, uh, that he was high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul goes back to the book of Exodus and says, you should not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And I think that even though we see foolish people doing that today, we as Christians need to stay above this fray. As wise people, stop looking for faults. And he talks about that here, uh, that those who are trustworthy and those who are wise, they, they conceal a matter. Uh, they don't just blurt it out and, and talk about everybody's problems. Uh, in verse 13, he goes about as a talebearer. A talebearer reveals secrets. A, a talebearer, a busybody. Uh, in other words, for a traitors in scandal. Newsmongers, they always want to know all the dirt. What's the dirt on this? What's what's the what is all the the dirty stuff? What's the yucky stuff about this? And too often we see this in the media in every aspect of our lives. Christians, let's get above the fray. Let's don't get involved in this. And I'm always disappointed when I see Christians participating in this, especially in the political arena. Let's just be straightforward. If you're a Republican, you're going to condemn the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, you're going to condemn the Republicans. But we are Christians who have a higher purpose. Our purpose is to spread the good news of God's kingdom. Now, when you start being critical on a political plane, what you're doing is immediately you've eliminated half of our audience. You've eliminated the half that disagrees with you. And why do we want to do that when we want the entire world to be able to embrace Christianity? And so there's a warning from back in the time of Proverbs and is reiterated in the New Testament. Stop this kind of behavior. He says, with the mouth, with his mouth, a godless man destroys his neighbor. But through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there is joyful shouting. It seems like people know a good leader from a bad leader. This uh, reminds me actually of Herod. King Herod was a terrible leader. And uh, he did a terrible thing. He gathered up all the Jewish leaders that he could when it was come time for his death. 
And uh, he gave orders to his men that when his death was announced that these Jewish leaders would be struck and killed. And that's exactly what happened when Herod died. These Jewish leaders uh, were, were murdered. And Herod's motivation was he didn't want people to cheer when he died. He wanted there to be mourning in the land. So to guarantee there'd be mourning when he died, he had these people executed. And uh, by the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. By the blessing, by the good things they're saying. But by the mouth of the wicked, it's torn down. He who despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps silent. He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. It's not that they're not telling the truth. It's just talk about things that they ought not to be talking about, especially for leaders of our country, leaders of our churches. Verse 14, where there is no guidance, the people fail, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. But there's no guidance. Uh, some of the translations say where there's no vision. Uh, leaders of visions, of guidance, lead the people. And an abundance of counselors has victory. I think God in his wisdom declared to the church that we should have elders and not unelders. The church should be led by a, a group of men. And, and I always am amazed at the wisdom of, of that. That it's not just one man saying, here's the way we should go. It's three trying to decipher and look at the, the times that we're living in and say, you know what, this is the way we should go. And, and to discuss with one another. And he says there's wisdom in that. And he says where there's not this kind of guidance, the people fall. And where there's an abundance of counselors, there is victory. Verse 15. He who is a guarantor for a stranger will surely suffer for it. But he who hates being a guarantor is secure. Going back to chapter 6, talked about co-signing, uh, being a guarantor for somebody else's loans. Don't do it, he says. Don't be a co-signer for someone else. Don't take responsibility for somebody else's debt because you will pay that debt. So don't do it. Verse 16, a gracious woman attains honor and ruthless men attain riches. You know, some of these proverbs just make us scratch our head a little bit, but others are pretty obvious. The first part's kind of obvious. A, a uh, gracious woman attains honor. You know, a good woman, she's honorable. And a ruthless man attains riches. Why would a ruthless man attain riches? Well, I guess that's just the way of, of life. The people who are ruthless sometimes do it. Uh, some of the translations actually say a gracious woman attains honor for her husband. I think about uh, Naboth. Uh, he was a wealthy man, but he was a foolish man. And his wife, Abigail, though, she was uh, quite a wise woman. And she's known for her, woman, her wisdom. And she's honored because of that. And we remember the confrontation that Naboth and uh, David had. And uh, she, she uh, saves the, her family from ruin because of her husband. Uh, she gained honor, but... Uh, he, even though he was rich, uh, you know, he wasn't a very honorable person. Uh, I always like the phrase, you know, what do you, what do you get a, a goose egg or a nest egg? Depends on the chick you marry. And uh, that's what he's saying here. A gracious woman attains honor and, and she's really going to influence even a ruthless man. He's going to become rich because of her. The merciful man does himself good, but the cruel man does himself harm. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. He who is steadfast in righteousness gets a true reward, uh, will attain to life, and he who pursues evil will bring about his own death. Uh, it, again, it seems like I can get back to this idea of karma. You know, you're going to you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to, it's all going to come back to you. He talks about deceptive wages. Um, you know, being a good businessman, once again, goes back to verse one. Don't have deceptive wages. Don't bid the job for one thing and then charge another. 
you know, don't be deceptive about your wages. Don't tell your employer that you work for an hour for such and such a wage and then go in and loaf for an hour. Uh, you've been deceptive about that wage. You know, the, the good worth, work ethic that Proverbs continues to tell us to have. And uh, here he, he, he's talking about that once again. Uh, verse 20. The perverse in heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their walk are his delight. Assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished, but the descendants of the righteous will be delivered. Again, this kind of idea of, of karma comes out, doesn't it? Uh, this idea that uh, we are going to reap what we sow. Uh, this is going to be a constant theme uh, as we go through here. And as we continually uh, make the contrast between the merciful and the cruel, between the wicked and the righteous, between the full and the and the wise, be sure you note that as we go through these Proverbs, that each one is making a contrast between these two different things. Verse 22. Seems like a verse out of place, but such an important concept. He says, as a gold, as a ring of gold in a wine snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. <laughs> Boy, when the Holy Spirit wants to make a point, he knows the words they use. Like a gold ring in a pig's nose. A gold ring, a beautiful, shiny, expensive gold ring. He says, it's like a gold ring, this expensive gold ring in a pig's nose. A pig's nose is, is filled with all kinds of filth and slime and slop and goop and oh my goodness it, it, even if you you said oh, go kick that go kick that gold ring you might want to say i don't know it looks pretty terrible and he says that's a beautiful woman who lacks discretion and how many times have we seen beautiful gorgeous women who instead of doing something good with their beauty have have sold it for nothing and have made ruin of their life and have just totally lacked just judgment and discretion. And, uh, and he says they're like a gold ring in a pig's nose. You know, sometimes you just see someone in, uh, you know, maybe a beautiful starlet or actress or uh, someone in that category usually seems to be the case where you think, wow, they're beautiful, but... Wow, they're like a gold ring in a pig's nose. That proverb comes to mind quite a bit, it seems. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. Ah, that's a pretty easy one. If you seek, you will find. The desire of the righteous is good. The expectation of the wicked is wrath. Both of them seek for something, and they both find it. They both sow something, and they'll reap the same thing. I'm going to go to Galatians 6. You know, Galatians 6, it, it almost sounds like this would be in the book of, of James. But it's something that Paul said at the end of Galatians. He said, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Do not lose heart in doing good, for in due time you will reap if you do not grow weary. He's trying to tell us, don't give up. You will reap what you sow. You know, don't give up during these times here. We are going to reap what we sow. Let's, so let's make sure we're sowing good things. You know, it's too bad that some people say, you know, I, I don't care what's going to happen. I've just got to, i got to get my stuff. i got to get my things. i got to do my stuff. And uh, a lot of selfishness going on. And uh, you might reap what you sow if you're not careful. But he tells us, though, you will reap good if you don't grow weary. There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there's one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. 
He who holds, withholds grain, the people will curse him, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. Uh, here's a series of verses put together that talk about the wisdom of being generous, of giving, uh, of being known as a giver. And he says, the generous man will be prosperous. Uh, the way he waters will himself be watered. Uh, you cannot outgive God. God will continually bless those who bless others. And uh, that's what he's saying here. The blessings will be on the head of, of the one who sells, the one who allows others to live by this. It doesn't hoard up what he has. Verse 27, he who diligently seeks good seeks favor, but he who seeks evil, evil will come to him. Again, that idea of getting what you're looking for. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flurry like the green leaf. He who troubles his own house will inherit wind, and the foolish will be servant to the wise heart. The one who troubles his own house. Uh, you know, we hear phrases like, well, uh, you know, there's nothing more important than family. Uh, families first. And those are good sentiments to have, but we know those who trouble their own family. Like he says here, they trouble their own household. They, they bring discord. They disrupt it. They're always bringing problems of some sort. They're, they're dividing it. And he says that their inheritance will be the wind. <laughs> What's the wind? It, it's nothing. Uh, no one is going to remember them because all they have done is, is cause trouble. And the foolish will be the servant to, to the wise-hearted. Uh, he's not going to have enough to continue on as as the rest will. Verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who, so, and he who is wise wins souls. Uh, the fruit of the righteous, there's a fruit of the righteous. He's like a river of life, and he, he wins souls. He sees the importance of people, and as Christians, to be a soul winner, we talk about that, to uh, talk to others about God. And then verse 31, if the righteous will be rewarded in the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Uh, how many times can he say over and over, and you're going to reap what you sow? And if the righteous is going to be rewarded on earth, well, how much more the wicked and the sinner? They are going to also reap what they sow in this life. And the righteous will reap in this life what they sow. And then in eternal life, uh, reap eternity. Uh, so I, we went through chapter 11, and, and I, I hope that as we went through each one, I, I've been able to bring out the gist of the, of the text. And as you can see, as you go through this with your own children, that uh, they're not really that hard and not that difficult to understand. Uh, if you give them a thought or two and just think about it, meditate them on, it becomes clear. And there's so many ideas here that, that come out in this particular text. Uh, the ideas of how we treat our neighbors and how we're to be generous, and uh, how we are to be fair in our business dealings. These are all coming out in this chapter. Well, I hope you've been blessed by looking at uh, chapter 11. We'll get, come together again with chapter 12 on Tuesday. You have a good, good day.